central India, a mountainous area extends 500 kilometers across the province of Madhya Pradesh. The mountains and the accompanying forest belt still contain approximately half of the forests and habitats of the country's wildlife. These are the jungles that inspired Kipling in his book on the virgin lands, and even today, they are still the best preserved in the whole of India. Located in these forested lands are the Bandhavgarh, Shivpuri and Kana National Parks, probably the best places in the world for watching tigers. Kana National Park is considered the Gorongoro of India. The physical similarity is relative because, although it is not a crater, the surrounding hills are the result of ancient volcanic activity. What really gives substance to the comparison, in fact, is the variety of animal species that live within it. Because in Kana, one can still enjoy what the marvelous natural heritage of India must have been only a century or so ago. Kana encloses a great variety of habitats. There are different types of forest that range from dense bamboo thickets to mixed deciduous forest and extensive grasslands, growing lush grasses that form the staple diet of the majority of the park's herbivores. The different species of ungulates living in Kana are the staple diet of the carnivores, among which are the tigers, which is why they are indispensable to the reserve's ecological balance. One of the park's main zoological jewels are the barasingas, or marsh deer. Their food source are the grasses that grow in the pastures of the nalas, or muddy plains. The tall and compact grasses grow on the muddy plains even in summer, given the high humidity level, and they provide a hideout for the herbivores and their young. None of the names attributed to this deer is appropriate. In the local language, Barasinga means 12 points and refers to the deer's horns. But adult males generally have between 10 and 14 branches, some having as many as 20. The name of marsh deer is not correct either and should be used for a more common subspecies because in Kana, the only place in which they survive, there are no real marshes and this subspecies, although living its daily life on the muddy plains, has hoofs that are adapted for running on hard ground. At the end of the 19th century, the Barasinga abounded throughout central India. Fifty years later, in the middle of this century, only 3,000 were left, and in 1970, only 66 Barasinga survived here, being the only representatives of their subspecies remaining in the world. The emergency measures taken to protect the last Barasingas succeeded in raising the population to 550 by 1988, and since this date, their number has been increasing slowly. The key to the recovery and survival of these deer is based on the preservation of their habitat 
tall grasses. In order to do this, grazing had to be prohibited in specific areas and certain villages had to be relocated outside the park boundaries. If more tall grasslands were obtained, there would be more food for the Barasingas, but in particular, breeding of the species would be encouraged, since these deer do not reproduce without a sea of grasses where they can hide their young from predators. The increase in grasslands has favoured other species. Chittal deer and wild boar hide here and feed on the muddy plains in the same way as the Barasingas. Their numbers have also increased and today ecosystem preservation measures tend to protect the grasses from excess numbers of herbivores, which is why certain areas have been enclosed. Chittal deer are the most numerous large mammals in Kana. They are extremely prolific and the adult females give birth to a young animal every six months. Their demographic increase could imply a problem for the park, but it is curbed by the carnivores. Approximately 40% of tiger's food is made up of chittal deer, and they are also an important element in the diet of leopards, wild dogs and jackals. Chittal deer form into groups numbering approximately 15. In their feeding places, it is common to see them accompanied by a group of Lango monkeys, with which they have reached an association which benefits them in a dual sense. Langurs form troops of between 10 and 20 animals of both sexes and all ages. They feed on a wide variety of fruits, berries, shoots and leaves, but are very selective when it comes to eating. They take a piece of fruit, have one or two bites, and then throw it away before taking another. Similarly with leaves, where they only eat the stem. And the remainder is exactly what the chittal deer enjoy. The fruit and leaves discarded by the Lango monkeys or those falling from the trees due to the monkeys jumping and swinging attracts the chittal deer to the bottom of the trees, where they simply have to wait to be able to taste the morsels that fall like manna from heaven. Langurs and chittals cohabit in perfect harmony. There is no mistrust between the females of the two species with offspring and the young play at ease in groups without showing any fear of the animals of the other species. The monkeys imply a further advantage for the groups of chittles. From the treetops, the langurs have an extraordinary field of vision and warn the herbivores of the presence of predators approaching the group with their cries of alarm. A very useful advantage for an animal that forms the staple diet of so many extremely powerful carnivores. In the forest twilight, a group of wild dogs have killed a male chittal. The 
Dolls or wild dogs are the second most powerful predators in the park after the tiger. They hunt in packs of four or six, replacing each other in pursuit of their prey with a coordination that transforms them into magnificent hunters. Dolls, called Sonha Kuta by the locals, are great runners that only hunt in the early and late hours of the day. In their chases, they are able to exhaust any animal and even tigers at time are wary of them. When the remains of a prey are abandoned by the hunters, they are immediately seized upon by different species of carrion scavengers and opportunists. In Kana, there are four species of vulture and a large population of jackals, between which there is fierce competition. The jackals are stronger and more intelligent than the vultures. In fact, they are both carrion scavengers and efficient hunters, although not as well organized as their cousins, the dolls. When they find a carcass or catch a prey, they are the first to eat, despite having to fend off the pillaging vultures. Time to time, their patience runs out and the jackals put the intruders in their place. There are no wild Indian elephants in Kana, but they can be seen at different points feeding at their ease. They are domestic animals, in fact used by the Mauts or Kanakas, the elephant drivers, to cross the forest and carry small groups of tourists. The Mauts and their elephants are a single entity. In their camps they care for their animals, to which they owe their livelihood, and in short, their way of life. They worship Ganesha, the elephant-headed god, and their lives revolve around these animals, which they raise from calves to obey their orders. Caring for the elephants is a hard job and the mouths devote a large part of the day to it. The animals feed naturally in the park's grasslands and forests, but an elephant also needs extraordinary care.
The Kanakas take their animals to the nearest river each day to wash them. Elephants love water and enjoy allowing themselves to be washed by their owners, for whom bathing is a hard cleaning job. A little similar to us, washing our cars every day, if they were three times as big, and if they moved as well. A good daily scrubbing with hard prairie grasses frees the pachyderms from parasites and skin impurities and relaxes them, strengthening their bonds with the mahouts. This way, it is easier to dominate the elephants when they transport visitors on their backs. Visitors to Kana can cross the park in the keeper's jeeps, driving on the dirt tracks which cover a small circuit. But if you want to experience Kana's nature more closely, there is no better way than mounting an elephant and penetrating more deeply than the tracks traced by tourism. Only on the back of an elephant can you delve into the dense Kana jungle. The animals do not seem to be frightened by the passing of the pachyderm in the same way as with a motor vehicle, which is extremely important in these depths, where they all seem alert and flee in face of the slightest threat. There is good reason for the animal's mistrust, because in the depths of these jungles lives the most powerful predator of all, Sher, the tiger lord of the jungle. Of the eight subspecies of tiger existing only a century ago, only five remain and one of these, the Chinese tiger, is on the verge of extinction. The Bengal tiger is the most numerous subspecies. In India, where its population is highest, there are between 5,000 and 7,000, scarcely a reflection of the 100,000 and more which lived at the end of the last century. And of all the places on the Indian subcontinent, it is here, in Kana, where the tigers have the largest and most stable population. When a tiger prowls through the jungle, animals emit their warning signs. The langur monkeys utter their raucous and prolonged cry, while samba deer and chital deer beat the ground and raise their tails by way of warning. The tiger's skin makes it invisible in the shadows of the jungle. Measuring over three meters from muzzle to tail and wearing an average of 230 kilos, the camouflage of the largest feline is fundamental in allowing it to approach its prey, despite which it usually needs 12 attempts to catch one. Only the gar, mistakenly called the Indian bison, commands respect from the feline. 
The gar is the largest wild bovid on earth, and is another of Kana's zoological wonders. They live in herds of up to 20 in number and roam through the thickets feeding on bamboo, grasses, rind and fruit. By eating the old hard leaves, the gars give the young leaves a chance to grow and by breaking the high bamboo, they stimulate the sprouting of new foliage in the lower levels of the forest. The calves are the only ones that the tigers and dolls can attack successfully if they manage to separate them from their mothers. But the adults are too powerful. The large males wander alone through the bamboo forests. 1,000 kilograms of brute force and almost two meters in height make them almost impossible to catch for the majority of Kana predators. Armed with an extremely well-developed sense of smell, the gars are permanently on the alert to everything that surrounds them. For only a few days in the year, tigresses are sexually receptive. Courtship can last a week or ten days, and only in places where the tiger density is sufficiently high can they find a male to mate with them. In a world in which they are increasingly rare, the coupling of tigers is extraordinarily difficult to watch. Copulation takes place between 20 and 50 times a day for a period of between two and five days, and always in the deepest depths of the jungle. During the exhausting courtship, both male and female need frequent rests. The gestation period is short, approximately 15 weeks, because if a tigress had a long gestation, carrying a large fetus, she would become sluggish and unable to hunt for herself. In the world of the tiger, the mother takes complete care of raising the cubs, and once the courtship has ended, the male is transformed into a potential enemy for the litter. The mating of this couple represents hope for the threatened population of the most powerful and handsome of the feline species. In Kana, it is estimated that the population totals approximately 100. But in a country with over 1,000 million inhabitants eager for fertile land, the future of the tiger continues to be a major concern for conservationists all over the world.